Without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lisa Mahau, who's going to be uh, the, the facilitator. Uh, as I said, he's doing some, some, some teaching in the, at, the, at the university, a master's student as well, and also the co-founder of BSS, the Black Student Stockfell Stroke Marikana. I don't know where the Marikana comes in, but uh, you, maybe you're going to explain it, eh? Okay, okay. okay. I see his uh, colleagues coming in here. Okay. If you want to just get a cup of coffee or tea or something to eat, please go out and get it and then come, come back inside. Okay, so good evening everyone and welcome to our guests, Luke and Simpiwe. Um, so today we're launching the spirit of Marikana, which is based on uh, an ethnography of working class struggles in Marikana. And I think it's, it's, it's important to keep our memory of the massacre alive. And it's important work that is done by academics and activists in South Africa, <coughs> particularly at a time where students are struggling in universities to decolonize our institutions, to make our institutions more inward looking in terms of uh, the social formations that exist. And with problems such as inequality and land, these should be the questions that dominate our critiques and problematizing. So Luke and Simpio have written this book, um, The Spirit of Marjigana, the story of working class rebellion and working class power that shook the minds and withstood the massacre. It tells the story of the worker activists and leaders at the world's three largest platinum mining companies who survived ongoing state-sponsored campaigns of violence, intimidation, torture, and murder to push forward a workers' rights agenda and begin hard work of transforming their workplaces and their nation. A close-up ethnographic account in the book brings the seemingly ordinary people behind the movement to life through vivid interviews and oral histories, from initial meetings to, to workers' committees to the mass strikes of 2012 <laughs> and 2014, that is the story. And I think it's particularly relevant for mm. us in thinking about what is happening there and the idea of social transformation, which I think comes in even in universities when we, we discuss transformation here and its relation to what happens in broader society. Uh, Luke is a senior researcher at the University of Johannesburg and spends a significant amount of time writing about grassroots militants but believes that he is at his best while standing by their side in a common struggle for social and economic justice. He is co-author of Marigana, A View from the Mountain and a Case to Answer, co-editor of Contesting Transformation, Popular Resistance in 21st Century South Africa, and the author of numerous articles on participatory democracy and contentious politics in South Africa. Simpiwe Mbata is a coordinator of the Tembelikli Crisis Committee, a, social, a socialist <laughs> civic organization in in South Africa, which fights for basic services for all. He first visited Marikana the day after the massacre to provide solidarity to the striking mine workers. He is also a part-time researcher at the University of Johannesburg and Witts University and co-author of Spirit of Marikana. So without further ado, I'll give over first to Luke to begin the presentation today. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us at NMU. Uh, and greetings to colleagues at uh, VIT sitting in the back. It's good to see you here uh, in the Eastern Cape. Uh, so, you know, there's been a lot in the news, and we know that it's now been uh, five years since the workers in Marikana were massacred by the police on 16 August 2012 uh, after a pro prolonged <coughs> strike. Uh, Mbongisi was there as well uh, at the end of August or early September. Uh, the, the strikers remained, it's important to remember that the strikers remained uh, on strike, they moved from below, from the mountain, from the kopi, uh, where they were massacred uh, as they were leaving the kopi, <laughs> as you saw in uh, Miners Shot Down. They moved, uh, they put down 
uh, their weapons like machetes and spears, but continued uh, to stay on strike. That evening, in fact, they held uh, a meeting in the informal settlement below Nkaneng, and we tried to document as many of these informal meetings amongst workers uh, as possible, as well as we could, through in-depth interviews uh, that we did. Sipiwe, uh, it's not Simpiwe, it's Sipiwe Mata, like it says uh, on the book. Uh, he spent, actually, the, the vast majority of 2013 in the Platinum Belt, uh, trying to undertake research. It was research on Lonmin, which was the site of uh, the Marikana massacre, you know that we have uh, in South Africa more than 80% of the world's platinum uh, underground in the Bushveldt uh, complex or in the, in the platinum belt and most of that is uh, in the, the Rustenburg region and there's three main uh, platinum mines there, that's uh, Impala, Lonmin and Amplatz and the, in the book we tried to, to document uh, the, the informal networks, the workers' committees, and the, basically the origins of the contemporary mine workers' movement, uh, which started in 2012 at Impala and then extended to Amplatz and Lonmin. Those are the three, the three major uh, platinum mines uh, in the country. But five years on, uh, after the 16th August, uh, the workers have seen uh, some victories, including from that strike. There was a 22% uh, wage increase uh, at Lawnman, and we saw other wage increases at Amplatz, which was actually had a longer uh, unprotected strike than uh, Lawn Lawnman did. And then we saw, of course, the, the five month strike. Uh, by the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union, who went on strike for 12,500, which was the same amount uh, that the workers had died for on the mountain on, six, on 16 August 2012. And we saw significant uh, wage increases. Sapiwe will talk more about uh, some of the current, um, you know, some of the current conditions politically uh, and economically that the workers find themselves in Marikana and the other region. But we also know that uh, no politicians, uh, no state officials, none of the police uh, who killed the mine workers uh, on that day have actually been uh, prosecuted. And the families of the deceased have called upon uh, the state to apologize, but they still haven't done that. Uh, because the, the families of the deceased know the truth. I think you guys by now also know the truth uh, that it was uh, some kind of a premeditated attempt uh, to slaughter the mine workers who are on a mountain demanding a living wage. And I think you've probably seen miners shot down. There's a newer uh, film called Strike a Rock, which is about the women of Marikana and the, the role of lawnmen uh, in, in Marikana in not improving the, the living conditions of the people of Marikana. And then obviously another award-winning book, uh, Murder at Small Copy, that's um, Greg Marinovich's book, uh, which is probably the, the most important book uh, that, that <coughs> talks about uh, the Marikana massacre and who's to blame. Um, but, but in this book, we don't talk about the, the massacre and we don't talk, therefore, only about the, the mine workers as objects of state or police brutality, uh, but we talk about them as subjects of transformation and as people who change the course of history. So in the process of self-emancipation, we argue that they became makers of their own history and shapers of the South African political landscape. The book is also about a small group of people committed to social change, in this case, radical economic transformation, uh, who helped create the conditions for the longest strike in South African mining history uh, in 2014. So it was not so different. Uh, the kind of movement that they forged was similar to the movement that was forged in relation to fees must fall and the kinds of uh, radical changes for free and decolonized education that uh, many of the students were calling for at NMU and across uh, the entire, across the whole country. 
Uh, so before uh, the trade unions, which is AMCU, that's the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union, that's the alternative union to the NUM. But before there was this union doing anything, um, there was a workers' committee which was independent of uh, trade union affiliation. In fact, the people who conceptualized the demand for 12,500, the living wage, were from two different trade unions. The National Union of Mine Workers, which was quickly at the time in 2012, and even before <coughs> that becoming uh, to the workers, the National Union of Management, that's what workers were actually calling it, and then there was the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union. Two workers, one man named Mufu Kang, uh, who decided to join the NUM at one specific shaft, uh, Kuri shaft, and another man uh, named Bulelani, uh, from, from, who decided to join Amku at Kuri shaft. They started um, saying that they were not getting paid uh, enough wages at Kuri shaft and they also said to themselves that at the other two shafts so there's three shafts at Lawnman Eastern, Western and Kuri and Kuri became uh, the focal point uh, for the mass movement uh, at Marikana, at Lawnman uh, Platinum Mine these two workers came together and said we don't have assistance for the the heavy drill that we're holding underground we need to call for more wages also they were looking at the other at the other mines and seeing that you know at these other places they're getting higher wages than we were also it's coming off of the back of the beginning of the strike wave which which started at Impala in January and February uh, 2012 and mine workers again had gone on unprotected strikes engaging with management uh, directly at that mine as well and there were there were kinds of deals negotiations and policies that the management had put in place to engage directly with uh, rock drill operators in particular in order to avoid strike action but which eventually backfired so these two workers uh, said to themselves we need to demand twice our basic salary that they were taking home which was five thousand multiply it so they multiply it by two and get ten thousand and the other two thousand was to come from the sympathy of the management uh, and then, but they said to themselves also, they'd be willing to negotiate. Even at that time, uh, they, they said, we were willing to negotiate, but the 12,500 was what we'd put there to startle the management and then to try to bargain, you know, for a couple, hundred, for a couple thousand uh, rands per month more than they were getting. So when they spoke to each other in the changing rooms, they said, we need to have a meeting of five to 10 workers and then they organized that meeting uh, by word of mouth and they had a meeting of five to ten workers. After that, uh, they put pamphlets up um, and they had another meeting of 45 <laughs> to 50 workers. And the, at that point in time, the manager um, of Curry Shaft, a man named Mike DaCosta, who had to present some of this evidence at the Commission of Inquiry. So we were able to triangulate what the RDOs, what these rock drill operators, Bulelani and Mufu Kang, were telling us with what uh, Michael DaCosta, the, the manager at Curry Shaft, had presented to the commission. And at that time, he, present, he told the commission that he was becoming worried that these rock drill operators were organizing themselves because they were beginning to do so at all of these three platinum mines and they had already won major victories and shut down the entire mine at the other Impala shaft. Then they held a third meeting. First they had 5 to 10, then they had 45 to 50. Then on the 21st of June uh, 2012, there was 100 rock drill operators organized outside the shaft at, at Curie <coughs> Shaft. And all of them had on their mind this idea uh, that they needed to get an improvement in the wages. In particular, that management needed to talk to them about the demand uh, for 12,500. Uh, this is the notes um, that Mufu Kang took uh, at a meeting that he had uh, with the manager, uh, Mike DaCosta, uh, and Bulelani was also, it's uh, Bulelani Makabeni, and then uh, uh, Alphonse Mufu Kang. 
uh, and they had the meeting with Mike DaCosta, and basically they detail here that they want um, the 12,500 increase uh, in order to get compensation for the hard work that they're doing. And at this meeting on the 21st June 2012, they talk about how the strike, that, that, that actually this demand is not about um, having a strike, it's simply a memorandum of requests. So there was no violence involved in the conceptualization of the demand and there was no not even a high level of militancy at the at this beginning uh stage also there was no inter-union rivalry it was the it was an num member and an amku member both approaching management about why they need improvement in their wages and uh mike da costa himself as well also talks about uh in our book but also in in the in the commission of inquiry how startled he was about this demand for twelve thousand five hundred. um and you know so he went back and spoke to his different uh executive people there then they reported back to the rock drill operators and later they decide that later they met again uh with management on the 2nd of july 2012 and they were told to come back to speak to management. They came back to speak to management at the end of July 2012. This is now approaching the time that the strike was about to start because it's the end of July 2012 and the massacre happens uh, two or three weeks later. Um, what happens there is that the, the management gives these rock drill operators a once off 750 uh, increase because they don't have assistance so that's seen as some some kind of you know major concession to the to the management then the workers leave that meeting and report back to the workers and they say what about the 12,500 the management also said to them that we can't <coughs> give you at Korea we can't engage with you at Korea the this particular shaft because that'll make it a little crazy if all the other shafts start demanding different amounts. What if at Eastern, the other major shaft and Western, they demand 15,000 or 9,000? We can't entertain a wage increase for rock drill operators only at Karee shaft. And the workers interpret that to mean that one, management have money sitting in their coffers, and two, that they need to unite the rock drill operators at the two other major shafts. So they leave that meeting and go meet with leaders at uh, Western and Eastern, the two other shafts, and say, let's have a mass meeting on the 9th of August, which was uh, Women's Day, uh, at the stadium three th and it ends up being 3,000 people and the main item on the agenda of all the rock drill operators who are at that meeting it's a huge mass meeting 3,000 rock drill operators from all the shafts is of how are we going to get management to engage with us about the demand for 12,500 <coughs> uh, the rest of this is basically history you know it's documented uh, the 9th to the 16th August is, uh, you know, has been documented at the Commission of Inquiry, in Miners Shot Down, in Maracana, View from the Mountain, in Murder at Small Copy. But in the book, we're trying to place, you know, that moment and the events which led up to it in, you know, a bigger historical context, uh, essentially. But I'll just say that at, at, on the 9th of August, they decide to to march to management offices the following day um this is one of the people here uh Bele, um who's up on murder charges now uh so none of the police are up on murder charges none of the politicians or state officials uh but Bele, because he was one of the worker leaders you can see him uh in front of the mountain he's one of the the leaders there on the on the 10th of august uh this is before they went to the mountain on the 10th of august they're now meeting um you know a, a mass of mine workers outside the management offices asking about the 12,500. um then they march on the following well then they're told by management that they must go to their trade union so they march to the NUM because that's the dominant union at the mine at the time. The one shaft Korea was divided between NUM and AMCU. We detail why that's the case at that point in time, but I won't go into it here. 
um, but they march to the dominant union, the National Union of Mine Workers, who has the majority, you know, of of membership at Lonmin. And then they're shot at. They they actually believe people are killed. You know, there's a frenzy. Then they run to the mountain. The, the mine workers believed that two people were killed, but they were injured and sent to hospital, and they survived. But this is the major uh, turning point in the actual struggle for 12,500, because it's when the mine workers arm themselves uh, in self-defense, and after this, uh, it's when people start getting killed uh, on the following days. And a mountain committee is uh, set up, and you know, Mom Bush and other people, uh, Mom Bush, uh, the man in the green blanket, Mr. Noki, um, who was targeted on the 16th of August, and the autopsy revealed that he had 14 bullet holes in his body. He became at that time one of the key leaders, as did a number of uh, people here, and they formed an actual, actual committee of different people uh, from different shafts uh, to represent the workers in front of the mountain. And it became a state of emergency, complete and absolute state of emergency in Lonmin, Marikana. But now they believe that two people were killed. Other people are also uh, killed. I won't go into that detail here, including mine workers uh, and security uh, and the police in a battle that's played out on the 13th of August. When the police attack the mine workers, the mine workers fight back and they end up uh, killing each other. And so the, the, the strike continued, as I mentioned, some of the detail how it continued after the, you know, so the mortuary vehicles were sent in. It was premeditate, premeditated. Sir Ramaphosa caused, called it a dastardly criminal act. It was said that it is D-Day and now this thing must die if the strike doesn't end now. On the 16th of August, you know, <coughs> the the mine workers were massacred, but they continued to remain on strike uh, until mid-September. But while that was happening, uh, strikes were popping up all over the country. But in, in the platinum belt, the, long, the largest platinum mine in the world, which is Anglo Platinum, started to go on strike. And a similar process had been unfolding uh, in June and July. Uh, workers at a specific shaft had conceptualized the demand for 16,070. Uh, so this is the, the memorandum that they put forth to management in June already, uh, before the Americana workers went on strike. The Americana workers didn't go on strike till the 9th of August, but already these people were mobilizing April and May 2012. Uh, a similar process was unfolding because it was one shaft, Kusaleka, here they're detailing, you know, the amount that they should be paid uh, based upon uh, different things, like a basic salary of 10,000, <coughs> a living out allowance of 2,000, a clocking in <coughs> risk allowance per month, um, car and petrol allowance, meal allowance, and when you combine all of that, it adds up to 16,070. Um, so. There was also harsh repression in the Amplat strike. It went on for 10 weeks. Uh, the CEO tried to fire, threatened to fire all the workers, threatened to fire 12,000 workers, uh, but the workers extended their strike, extended their reach. Um, so I've gone through just bits and pieces of you know the origins of the strike, the origins of the movement at Maracana. I've mentioned the one at Amplatz, so that takes us through actually the beginning of the book. And then the, there's one chapter that talks about the relationship between institutional and non-institutional forms of mass mobilization. And here we're referring to the worker committees that were set up as a non-institutional uh, means by which to access <coughs> power and to leverage management in order to make decisions uh, in their interests. So that's one of the last chapters. Um, and then 
Chapter 6 is about insurgent trade unionism, and it looks, uh, and the book largely looks at how AMCU, the Association of Mine Workers, which led the 2014 uh, five month strike around the demand for 12,500, um, actually was not led by the trade union in a sense but was a result of the rank and files militancy or insurgency that continued to bubble beneath the surface in 2013 after these major strikes. And that again came into fruition in the form of a strike, of a strike that now involved all of the, the platinum mines at Amplatz, Lawnmen and Impala, whereas previously they went on strike separately for different amounts, now they were all united uh, in a symbolic, symbolic struggle for 12,500 and, and in a claim, you know, they say we die, all their t-shirts around there would say, you know, we di they died for a living wage. Um, they died so that we could have our dignity and economic freedom. These are the things that uh, people would say. The state killed us because we were seeking radical economic emancipation. So in 2014, they united around the demand for 12,500, <coughs> which was symbolic and actually was the demand which mine workers had died for in order to improve um, their lives. So I think uh, this, <laughs> we tried to divide the presentation. So I tried to just give a little bit of a structure of the book. And I think Sapiwe is going to give uh, a little bit more context and also talk about some of the current things uh, that are going on and also problematize, I think, um, the trade union that is operating in Maracana <coughs> and across the platinum belt now. Because for many people, it hasn't led and doesn't have the potential to lead to the transformations that we thought it might. Thank you. Sorry about that. I know you were like um, listening to the guy that is um, uh, perceived as, as the hero, or probably a guy who has an ear for, for the workers. And um, he just said here that he workers were burning, probably didn't say burning, but they were like burning t -sh yellow t-shirts of NUM. So they replaced those t-shirts with green t-shirts that um, brought hope to workers. But um, as you can see, he normally talks like this. He talks left, probably he walks right. <laughs> yeah, he does things his own way. <laughs> Um, okay, um, my, my talk today will be will based on the AMCU itself and uh, probably the, the, the then living condition of the workers and currently living conditions and economical conditions of the workers in the platinum belt. Um, I'm a little bit shaking a bit because uh, it's, it's cold in, in, in PE. <laughs> Luke is enjoying this weather because he grew up under this cold. <laughs> yeah, and then I just received bad news now, 10 minutes ago, that my child has been robbed. So um, I'm kind of like, so you please bear with me when I'm, I'm you know. So, um, I will, I will start by saying um, the living conditions of the workers are, are the one that made them probably to sit down and say, we cannot longer move on, work in these kind of conditions and pretend as if everything is fine. Because they were working, children back home knew that their fathers, their brothers, are working, and we we know. I will I will say this: we black children or communities or people believe that people who work in the mine are the well, are well paid than any other worker in the country. But um, if you if you look at the conditions that they they work under and look at how they are paid, 
it's, 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 it's another story. In fact, during that time before the, the massacre, the workers, drug dealers, were paid 5,518. And at a point in time, <laughs> there was a research that was done by um, uh, um, okay, I'm sorry. The research what was done by Labor Research <coughs> Services it was conducted in, in before 2011, and they were looking at the gap between the CEOs and the mine workers. They found out that the CEO were earning like 20.2 20 million per year, or 55,000 rand per day. So looking at the demand of the workers that they demanded 12.5, I mean, it clearly shows that the mine itself can pay that. You know, if you look at the mines, they were not like, the CEOs are not doing much compared to, to the hardship that mine workers go through when they go underground. I mean, they risk their lives. They can die. <coughs> like, if you go underground, it's like you're telling your, your family and everyone that knows that I might not come back. Um, Okay, in the book also, we are focusing on individuals and the roles that they played prior to 2012, 16 August, where people, <coughs> were, where workers were massacred. And also, we look at um, who are those people? Where do they come from? And also, as Lucas stated, that there are people like uh, Alfonso Mufukeng, um, Bulilani Makabin. Those are the architects of 12.500. And are not, those are unsung heroes. Those are the people who brought this 12.5 where we see everyone is talking about. <coughs> But no one, no one, no one <coughs> says anything about them. Um, we're trying to understand the formation of Independence Workers Committee and what, susta what sustained it after the workers were killed. Lucas said also that they had their T-shirts that says um, they will they will fight for 12.5 because their fellow brothers have been killed. So we wanted to, to go deeper and understand, but why? You know, you know normally in, in our township, in, in, our, in, in our space where we live, when people are killed, we tend to withdraw from what we think it's our demand and it's rightful ours. But they went on. The following day, in fact, the same day after the massacre, they met and tried to find the way forward. We wanted to find those people. Who were they? What made them to go on and on and demand that, although they were <coughs> killed? Um, we know that their living conditions were bad, they were earning nothing. In fact, most of them, they were living in a shacks. Even now, some of them, I would say 60%, they still live in shacks. Their living condition has not changed. Most of the workers, they live by loaning money from the loan shacks. They have, they have been punished. Although, in this clip, if you go to your tube, you'll find that Matunjwa is claiming that most of the workers currently, they are earning 11,713. Those are the guys who work under underground. 
and uh, most of uh, the guys who are in grade four who are working on the surface, they are earning 10,121. And he's also claiming that by next year, they'll be earning 13,273.60 cents. But currently, when we did our, um, our research to, to look at um, since, <coughs> since, okay, from, from 2012 till now, how are your living conditions? Have your living conditions uh, get better or the same or worse? We found out the, the majority. The majority will say, well, we're getting something, but the problem is the tax. The more money we get, the more tech, the more we are taxed. So, which means um, in this current form, you see people are, are promised something, and then when they are getting that, that, that thing, it's been taxed, which means they, 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 are, they have been sold a, a, a dream. You know, there's a false hope to say, I'm ending March, but they cannot uh, uh, take their children to, to university. One of the strike miners of uh, Amplats in 2014, when we interviewed him, he said, we want this money. In fact, we, 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 we demand it because the living, the living conditions that we work, the, the working conditions that we work under, they, they push us to demand this certain money. We, wa we also need to see our kids going to university. We don't want them to come here and work like us. We followed our fathers, our grandfathers working in the mine. They died without nothing. So we don't want our children to also travel the path that our forefathers and our fathers traveled. So you can see that they're not doing that for themselves. They are doing that for, <coughs> for, for their kids, for, for, for the future <coughs> generation that will come work in the mines. They want to change that. They want to transform that. As the students want to transform the universities. So, um, our book, it, show, it, 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 it should be clear uh, to everyone that um, by, by, by now, that this book is um, unpolitically uh, um, based on the, on, the, on the workers' perspective and strike leaders and experience of organizing. Because these, these people are perceived as um, illiterate. You know, when they go to strike in 2012, they were called names. They were called faceless, faceless people. And these are the people who, 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 who dig the wealth, who, who go underground <coughs> and make sure that the country has, has, has the economy intact. But when they demand what is rightful theirs, they are called names. So we, we, we could easily get the perspective views of the miners, of, of the mine bosses, the perspective of the union then was NUM, but the workers themselves, they needed a platform to voice whatever they think they should tell the world about their sufferings, about the conditions that they were at, and which they are still trying to fight. But the problem is, it's when I'm going to, to talk about AMCO and the union at large. Um, the good thing that AMCO did that was, was lacking within the NUM was to listen to workers. Every time when workers speak, they listened. Even when they were negotiating during 2012, 2014, they made sure they come back and listen to the workers and tell and report back, in fact. They take the mandate, you know, but the thing that during those times, you know, you know when someone wants, to, <coughs> wants you to sleep 
and not focus on other on, on, on real issues. He will do what you what he thinks you want to hear. For example, um, in South Africa, when when the issue of uh, um, um, sorry, okay, when in South Africa, when the issue of um, I think in in in, in twenty twelve. When people were, were, were in 2010, when people were, were were excited about World Cup, there were deals that were signed. You know, just just people were not like, you know, focusing on those issues. They were concentrating on the on the World Cup. So within Amco also, it was like that. During that time of negotiation, uh, 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 Matunja would come and say, "Workers, you know what? Today." The, the mine records are saying this and this, and I told them that I won't take anything from them. As you can hear when he speaks, he's a, he's a pastor by, 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 <laughs> okay, he's a pastor, he's a priest. So you know how priests act. They want to be questioned. They don't want to be, to be, to be, to be asked questions. They become violent, you know, they, they, they change, become arrogant. So that's kind of Matunja. Matunja is like that. In those, during those times of negotiation, 2012, 2013, 2014, these uh, uh, um, workers, independent workers community, they were questioning some of the things because they're part of the negotiations. But when you meet with the masses, you change tune. You talk left. But when, we, when he's with the bosses, you talk otherwise, talk other thing. You know, so those who were like critic, on what he was saying, he labeled them as the rebels who want to bring new union. If, if you follow up the, the, the workers' community during 2012, you'll find there were guys like um, Mapanana, the guys like Gaddafi, who were uh, working in the uh, Amplats. Those guys were, were vocal. Those guys were leading the, the strike. Those guys made sure that no one is retrained or um, fired at Amplat during the, the wildcat strike, you know. But after taking decisions, which was the plan that they, that they made to join AMCO, well, they couldn't move forward because they had to have the, 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 the union. But the problem that they, they made, or Matunja made sure that it happened, is to kill the Independence Workers Committee. Because when we interview most of, the com most of those workers committee, they say to us, we wanted to maintain this workers community. We wanted to maintain this workers council. That will make sure that AMCO don't repeat the mistakes that NUM did. But because same guy, he had intentions, you know, he had a hidden agenda that I want to accumulate also because we need, we need to understand who is Matundra first, you know, where he come from because he was a chairperson of branch in 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 Kalinen, in Pumalang, in one of the mines, um, in the early 90s. He was um, he was he was he was fired because he has a fallout. He, he had a fallout with Gwede Mantashi. Then he was a secretary of town secretary of NUM. So he was like fired, you know. So workers themselves uh, uh, went on strike because they, they, they think Mat Matunja was the guy who speak out, <coughs> who speak truth to power. So he's their voice, you know. So that's when the AMCO was formed. So you can understand that AMCO was formed because uh, Matunja felt that he had no space within NUM. So he needed to create his own union or form his own union. Um, when he, when he, it, it, it disbanded or dismantled those work, workers' committee, he, he also pinpointed those who were vocal in questioning him. And also, like uh, uh, um, Gaddafi. Gaddafi once said to, when they were like joking or maybe <coughs> was in a meeting, I said, you know what, Matunja, I think we need to, to contest you. 
as a president of AMCO. Because we believe AMCO is our, our, our organization, it's our union. <coughs> so we need to have a, a conference where we'll elect new leadership. So he, 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 he felt that this guy is challenging <laughs> me, you know. So he cannot lay it down, you know. Those guys were exed. Those guys were fired within the union by, um, by, by, by Matunjo himself. He went out and said, these guys, they've been bribed by ANC. They've been given millions of money to open a new union. So guys, you know, you know, you know the problem within, within the mines is that uh, workers in the mine, if they see um, Matunjwa, they like see uh, God. You know, during the strike, they will, they will sing songs like Matunjwa is, is, is sent by God, Matunjwa is a messiah. Those, those things, I remember in, in 2014, long strike, we were in Amplats. Matunja will stand up and after those songs and say, uh, some of you here are sent by other unions. Uh, comrades, workers must watch out. And I want to tell you something. When you watch TV, don't watch, to the, watch the news. You only watch TV when, you, when I'm speaking. You gotta watch generation or something. So th those words, you know, they, they, they say something to us who are our observers on, the, on that space. Because we, after those uh, utterance, we saw him challenging the, 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 the workers committee, destroying them, made sure they are expelled from, from the union. And you must know if you are expelled from the union, you have no voice within the mines. You are easily targeted. If you were a leader then, then the, ma the management is easily targeting you and make sure that you work in hard condition and you leave work. Because I remember in 2014 after that, most of the leadership in Amplats were arrested. They were charged with murder, attempt murder, malicious to damage, damage to property, um, we even attended their court case. I remember one day we went to, to, to me and Luke and other comrades of mine, we went to visit them. We bought them some food. And they were like, yeah, comrade, you know my twins. They were telling us a lot of stuff. Now they were like opening up, you know. Um, even, even at court, we went there to give them solidarity. Workers were there, you know. They full support their leaders, but because now they're afraid of losing uh, membership within the union, even, even when we were like trying to interview them, at some point, they would like, uh, guys, who are you? You come from the University of Johannesburg. Okay, but do you, do you talk to Matunjwa? Like, guys, why, why should we talk to Matunjwa? Because we want to hear your voice. Matunjwa is not working underground currently. <coughs> doesn't know the hardship that you, you, you went under through. So why can't you tell us? But, so this is a, like an authoritarian <coughs> leadership that Matunjwa uh, 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 shows uh, within the workers, they, 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 are, they are threatened, you know. Currently, 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 we attended the case on the 20, 31st of July of the same workers who, who, who survived the massacre in, in 2012. We had like 17 workers who are attending, who are, who are charged with murder, attempt murder, a lot of things. Um, they're attending. So we went there on the 31st of July. I'm causing there. What I've observed is that workers they don't even trust each other. They can't stand. They have groups that <coughs> divide it currently. There's a group that supports Matunjo. There's a group that sees Matunjo as a, as a problem. Uh, prior to the court case, there was there were, there's a guy called Jack, Jack Cabo. He's a, um, a, a, a Rattenberg regional, regional organizer. Um, bef there's a guy that um, Luke talked about, Steve, who was killed, was assassinated. Um, he's a guy who brought Amku. In fact, he's the guy who, who may, in fact, there are stories with Matunja are similar. <laughs> Because he's the, he's the guy who, fall, who fell out of union and he was ex, ex, expelled. And workers 
remain underground, didn't go up, strike. Same thing happened to Matundra in Bumalang. It happened to Steve. And Steve is the only is a guy who put Amku to, to Korea, the shot that uh, uh, Luke was talking about. So there were times that Matunja when he was addressing workers in in, in, in Korea, workers will say, uh, you cannot speak unless Steve is here. Steve was assassinated. So uh, this guy, this guy Jack, who's a coordinator, who's a regional organizer, is workers they said is implicated in the assassination of Steve. So workers on, at Lone Mill went and closed. I think the thing is like last month, or, yeah, last month, early last month, early, 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 early July. They went and closed the AMCO office because they, they, they needed answers, because there's a leak or there is a, uh, uh, what do you call this? There is a, a rumor that um, Jack and Matunjwa are linked to the assassination of Steve. So this guy, Jack, re he resigned. Because workers, they, pro they, they just told him that they're going to kill him if he come to alone me. So what happened is that Matunjwa, the following week after this guy resigned, he went to alone me to a mass meeting before the the the, the thing that he saw. He went there and then he unfortunate part he, he came with police, you know. So the workers were like, now why? Why now you, you when you come to address us you bring police? Because I remember in, in the day of the massacre, before the massacre, well, uh, uh, he was oh, on, the, on the 15th, police wanted to escort him to the mountain. He said, no, you cannot escort me. These are the people. They won't kill me, they won't harm me. So why now he, he, he want to bring the police when he, when he want to address the workers? So these are the questions we should ask ourselves. That is, is, is Matunjwa really, really on the side of the workers or is Matunjwa want to accumulate uh, some wealth <coughs> because right now I think uh, I heard something, looks told me something that this guy, Makanya, he's the chairperson of the workers committee. He was in fact <coughs> the chairperson of the workers committee in, in Amplatz, uh, in the mine of, in, in Kuselega. He was asked expe expelled and then he was the chairperson of the um, AMCO in, in that mine. So he was expelled by, by, by AMCO and he went back underground to work. Doesn't have any union currently as we speak. But he was the one, he was the one who was leading everything. But you read about this guy in the book. Um, this guy told, uh, <coughs> apparently told Luke that Matundra <coughs> bought some shares in the mine. So you look at UNUM because workers were like saying this is no more a union that represent us. Some of the workers, some of the workers said it's a national union of management, you know, because they are where they were they were sleeping in bed with the management. They were in the pocket of the management. So if Matunja is going is by really if this is true, he bought some shares or he bought some mine. So where he is now? Is in the side of the workers, or is in, a, in a, is in the interest of the profit? Because we should look at the, the current unions in our in our in our country. Most of them they start like genuine, you know, like they represent the workers. But along the way, I think the subscription are, are the one that changes them. Because Matunja was making like 15 million per month out of the subscriptions. If you like multiply that 50 <coughs> <then> times <coughs> 350,000 workers, you get something like that. So, um, in my in my in my in my closing, I will say um, the 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 current the current living conditions of the workers in 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 the mines. Um, they might say, okay, because people, they love AMCO 
majority on the ground who doesn't really understand the politics there, they will say I'm has help us. But if you listen to them closely, you'll you will hear, you know, this this thing that they are they are afraid of saying something. Uh, last I think before June 16, I went in Rathenberg to interview some of the workers, just to find out. And then one of the guys said, um, it was better than, I'm just asking about the, the health and safety, you know, to say, uh, uh, are they better or uh, uh, worse, you know? This guy said, uh, you know what, um, okay, the money is fine, but the problem is, um, the safety measures are not there anymore. You know, there's something that's really called substandard. If, if there's substandards before we knew that they, we won't work, that should have to be closed. You know, even if someone gets injured or, or died, we'll close for three <coughs> days. But currently, it doesn't happen. You know, I ask him why. No, you know, TMR. Is, has been bought, you know, has been bribed. But you have like shop steward there who are AMCO members, so aren't they helping? Ah, don't talk about those guys. They get fair checks. They get paid by management. You know, you look at their, their airtime, they get 200 and something thousand in their airtime to use. That is given by management. So you look at Like the shop stewards who are supposed to represent the workers are paid by the, the, the mine. Isn't that the, the union should pay those uh, shop stewards? And, and they're getting fed checks. I mean, like, they're getting more. They're driving BMWs. They're buying, driving like Subarus, you know, like driving huge cars, like cargo cars. So they, 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 they are co-opted. They are corrupted, you know. As we speak now, I'm telling you, 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 might, you might hear that uh, in, in maybe before December, there'll be a new union <coughs> uh, in the platinum belt because um, of the auditor auditorium of uh, uh, Matunjwa, because they have no voice. Workers do not have voice. The leaders, if you try to speak truth to power, you'll be smashed. Um, on the, seven, on the 16, he said something, I said some, something on his mind. He said, if you, you challenge the king, you will, say those words again? You will do what? There will be hell to pay. There will be hell to pay or something, you know? And guess what? On the 17th, two mine workers were gone down. Two mine workers who were shop steward, were gunned down, were assassinated. Those who, 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 spot, who, who, who spotted uh, corruption within the AMCO were killed. You know, so you ask yourself, where are we going? Are, are these unions you know, representing the, 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 the interests of the workers or are they there to just accumulate wealth and buy shares? Thank you, I'll drop it. Thanks, Luke and Sipiwe, for such an informative view. Um, I'm, I'm, I used to say I'm following from a distance what's happening in Marikana through the links I have, but it, it, it's been quite an eye-opener, particularly the issues around AMKU, who I admit even I myself have thought that they were some sort of hero and everything. So thanks for enlightening us. Um, I'll open up for some questions that we can begin discussing as the floor. So I'll take about three. One. Two. Three. In that order. All right. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, it was quite enlightening. Um, I've actually been meaning to get um, murders at small coffee. Now I'm going to make sure since um, mm -hmm. it's been called uh, a recommended read. Definitely going to get that. Uh, my questions around the the role of Noon um, at, at at that time and, and, and the leading up into my <coughs> and um, how um, thing how the workers felt that the the, the movement itself no longer represented its views. Uh, my question is, um, what is, is is it is it because that? Um, 
with most organizations, even with political organizations, I'm taking into uh, cognizance what you just said now, but I'm, that um, if you've been there for a while, um, the environment tends up to swallow you, you know, where we've got, for instance, now, the end, the same government that brought liberation was the very same one that even if it might have won in its entirety, but it was an extension of government that went and turned the gun on its own people. Now, my question, my question is that, um, is, is, it, is it perhaps that people <coughs> were suffering from that syndrome as well, and that AMCO as well is heading in that direction? And also, uh, because you mentioned when you were speaking and, and, and how you said that the workers have started to be organized, is, are, are you saying that maybe AMCO is becoming a sort of a personality? You know, um, that everything is, um, is, is centered around that, and that it risks itself becoming another new. And what is its role now within the greater scheme of things? And what is its role do you think that it has to play in, in the future as well? And also, um, you mentioned that the working committee that existed today has been disbanded to a certain extent. You know? What was Anku's role within that? And is it possible that Anku has, has taken the power from the people and now decides you know what the people want? You know, we know what you want. We no longer need to consult you on that. And then lastly, um, and, 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 and this stems from an article I read um, a few days back. Um, what, was, what do you think was the media's role in this? And, and how this is not covered in, 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 in the way that it should be, you know, because this was, uh, it was, it was a great part of our history and, and something that ought to be known. Is it that um, the media has reduced Marikana into being another sort of uh, Women's Day event, Human Rights Day event? Is is that where we is that where we're going? Um, and yeah, yeah, that's that's my point. Sorry for going on the next. You can ask it for some of the people who aren't here as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think like the president uh, presented by the previous speaker, uh, more than one. Um, so, I've also looked at Marikana <coughs> from a distance um, and not intensely followed a lot of the things. So I've had more of a sense around misgivings around issues. Um, one of it was that, um, and I think you've answered to some extent, was that it often felt like it was more a battle of egos of unions than about workers' rights. Um, the second um, issue that I actually had quite a big question about was the focus arising out of Marikana seems to be focused against the state and not against management um, or the mine owners. Um, and yes, I understand why the focus is against the state because of the role played by police, but that role was played on private ground. And the police were brought there by management, um, or they were at least allowed onto the premises by management. So why has there not been a focus, particularly in respect of the demands, why is it not being against management and, and, and the minorities? And then <coughs> my second question, don't worry, I only have two of them. <laughs> <laughs> my, my second question has also been a sense that Marikana seems to, to be more about everybody else than about the, min the miners themselves. Um, even when you look at the um, investigation that was launched, one of the issues rising out of that, um, and it actually stopped proceedings for a while, was in respect of the fees of the lawyers. Um, and then suddenly it seemed to be a catalyst for everybody else's issue. 
um, which seems to be a little bit confirmed by, by you saying that the workers are exactly we or maybe worse off than they were before Malikana happened. Thanks. Okay. I think um, I'm going to have two questions. The first one is on, I think first let me just thank you for the report that this book is and just the kind of the perspective and the scale at which you've done this work. Um, I think it's quite important to do it at that level. Um, and I was particularly intrigued by the fact that uh, <coughs> the 12,500, how the 12,500 was formulated and came about. Um, because I think that, as you said, has been lost. Um, and we've attributed this to various studies by economists and sect sectoral determinations and the likes. Um, but um, I would like to find out, and perhaps you cover this in your book, how that demand was classified into a living wage, right? And what are the factors, discourses, um, studies, and institutional support led to that 12,500 becoming what we now understand to be a living wage? Um, and and I would also like to know how the demand was framed at different levels and in different spaces, the demand for 12,500 rents. Um, and perhaps that can help us understand why, as a demand, it found expression more in what we call extra institutional avenues, right? So why is it that the likes of you sort of established in um, trade unions did at large? Um, th the second one is, um, so <coughs> I'll pop it. Um, but the second one is around Matunjwa and his role in the movement. Um, and I'm worried that we might be reproducing this kind of personality cult in our analysis, that we might be reproducing the kind of personality cult that we see happening in that movement. And I'm wondering if we can't stretch our analysis of his role to look, and perhaps you do this in the book, and I'd like to hear more of it if you do, um, if we can't stretch our analysis of his role to what are the pitfalls within the organization itself, what is it in AMCO that is allowing him the level of power, gatekeeping, and control that, that he enjoys, right? And what, what, how has the democratic ethic that we saw at the beginning of the sort of insertion <coughs> been lost with the formalization of that collective, of, of that mass action? Um, so to sort of think of what are the sort of institutional loopholes that have allowed the kind of figure that he is right now to, to exist and hold him together with that. Because I think a focus just on him and what he does reproduces this kind of demagogue status um, that we, we see him enjoy in the movement. Yes, um, thanks and um, we can, looking forward to, to reading the book and uh, I thought sitting here while we have access to you, to both of you, maybe you're going to give us a, a little assistance with understanding, I suppose, from the, the flavor of the intersection of politics at that time. And was there a role played by the WASP, uh, the workers and, uh, you know, and socialist and socialist party? Are they still involved um, in the area there? And then as, as AMKU is also um, strengthening, as one reads, uh, you know, it's a sort of a, it's, a, it's, quite, a, it's quite a strange um, idea then that you have a, a personality cult and, and, and that kind of thing on the one hand, but then it takes, organization and structure actually to get numbers and and so what, <coughs> are, what are they doing right that they're actually able to attract those numbers and then of late there there was a, an attempt and a call to try to get Amku to align <coughs> with the new generation <coughs> of Avi and what is what is the position uh, of Amku with, with with regard to the the um, yeah the, the federations that we, we have at the moment uh, in the country? I'll scan one more question. Uh, mine is really around I think the last two speakers. 
Is, is there a sense of, especially with this disillusionment with Martin Joy, a sense of reimagining politics altogether, which also leads to the kind of organizational forms that are coming up? Is there a thinking around that from the mind work along the ground? Okay. Um, thank you. Oh, um, always um, amazed by how the discourse is shaped with the the massacre and the people who were killed by the police, but we never hear about the likes of Steve and the people <coughs> who killed the, the massacre. Now, my question is. What does this mean about the unity of the workers and the working class at large when someone from Noon and a person from Ampu joined together and decided to say, look, these are our struggles. We should unite and, 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 and form a united front to champion this struggle of this living wage. How, how, what does that mean? for the unity of, 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 of the working class. And also, do you think that this is actually a power struggle between the working class and the ruling class, where the government and the, 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 the mine owners work together to say, OK, look, let's intimidate them by shooting. And then the working class on the side Resisting. So, do you think this is actually a sort of power struggle? Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, um, I will try to, to, to elaborate on something that I've said and try to, to, to answer some of the questions. Those that I couldn't answer, maybe you remind me or you could they touch this on me. Um, I will write right to, to, to touch most of the children because um, I work in the ground with the mine workers. And then I, 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 I try, because it's not, it's not easy for anyone to sort of like uh, 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 know how people think if you don't socialize with them, if you don't build a, a strong, good relationship with the workers, like live where they are, socialize, go to the gatherings, so that they can be able to trust you better. Uh, as I'm saying now, they can <coughs> call now and say, hey, comrade, we have this problem, you know, I'm not working in the mind, but because we're trying to build that relationship, they, they, it, it, it created a space where they can be open and, and say whatever they want to say. Um, Matunja once said in the meeting, this union is my union. I went underground and stayed for 10 days without food, praying for this union. I own this union. So Matunja, he does have his executive, but Matunja, he's running the organization, he's paying himself, He's paying other people. He's a secretary, he's a treasurer, he's, he's everything. Those who are there, like the likes of uh, this guy, I forgot his name, just, I have his name. Th these guys are just like puppets. Do this. If you don't do this, you know what's going to happen to you. So Matunjua, as I was saying, is like a, a priest. You know, a priest, they will normally stand in a pulpit, preach, preach. Everyone who's there in the congregation should say amen. You know, whoever questions, whoever questions him, he'll be sad lie. You know, he'll be executed, he'll be assassinated. You know, the example is if we want to, like, if we went there and then we try to, to like, interview workers, like, especially the guys whom we knew that they were working, working <coughs> before joining AMCO. And they became soft to our brand, soft to our, uh, 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 yeah, like, you know. So when I tried to interview them after being part of the system, they started now changing too. You know, <coughs> no, you know what? You must start first talk to Karma or Matu, <coughs> to call the office, you know. 
So, before Matuza became Matuza that we know today, he was welcome. He, he welcomed us to interview him. I think in the first uh, a, a book that uh, Luke co authored with Peter Alexander, he, he was interviewing that book. He knew about us. You know, in one of the, I remember, there was a time in Joburg, I think it was 2014, there was a court, a, a labor court, and then there was these um, movements, you know, like uh, activists and groups, you know, were supporting AMCO, you know. He, he told the, 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 the crowd that uh, these guys are supporting us, you know, so we must welcome them. But when you look at it's another different story, you know, when addressing the workers, they will be like, don't ever allow anyone in this space. You know, so um, the role of, uh, you said the role of AUM during the, the massacre or before the massacre, it's, um, I would say, did it start then? It started way back in 1996 when workers formed the um, uh, mouthpiece, mouth, workers, mouthpiece in 1996. <coughs> uh, mouthpiece was the, was the union that was formed by workers who saw that NUM was in the pocket of the management. And if you look, if you look, if you, if you follow NUM from, from its formation in the, in the 80s, through the 90s, you find most of the leadership who are there are, are, is their ticket to parliament or to, 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 to you know? So you, you, you ask yourself, if it's not parliament, it's, 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 it's corporate, you know, especially in the mind, you know, and the likes of Ramaphosa. If you if, if <coughs> trace back the, those guys who, who led NUM then and now, 90% of, of, of NUM, after the massacre, you went straight to Parliament. Zogwan is a minister of uh, workers. They need to represent the interests of the workers. But because the the interest not with the workers, it's not the interest of the workers. Yes, the workers, you know, you know, if you can listen to these workers when they tell you their stories, you can cry. The same guys who are supposed to represent these workers are treating workers like dead, like kids. When they come and say, you know, I have a problem, they they show them, hey, who are you? What do you want? Go, you know, we're busy. I mean, you are talking <coughs> to these same people and you're talking them at death, you know. So if something comes, like if you say like this guy is both of them, in this book it will tell you both of them they were new in that area, in in London, in fact, you know. Yes, yes, they saw that no, no, this is not the man who should be any. The people who have been there for years are quiet. So we will talk. We will try to, you know, engage with the management. You know, they just joined. After the guy Steve, I was talking about Steve. After Steve was killed, after Steve was killed, or before he was killed, or after he was like uh, uh, expelled from the <coughs> union, when they asked, because they, what they did, they, they, they struck. They were all fired. <coughs> or 11,000 something. Yeah, 11,000 something workers at career shop. They were all fired. Because they refused to, what, to go and work because they wanted Steve to come back. The same union, MUM, quality with, with, with management, say fire all of them. They were re employed. 9,000 were re employed. The rest was we identify as, um, as town makers. So that's when the likes of Mufuke mm -hmm. and Marakabe, they're coming from uh, 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 Cartonville, that's where they get employed, you know? And then they join the unions that they were there, which was AMCO and, 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 and <coughs> So during that time, or before, as I said, 1996, AMCO is uh, <coughs> NUM is long within the, the workers. They were no longer representing the workers. They are, they, their aim was to just get a bridge to, 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 to the fat cake, to, 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 mm. to know you, whatever. Yeah. So, um, 
the role of media, um, you cannot talk much about media. We know media. We all know. They will, they will talk as if they are radical or they are not biased or all media bias. All media. They have their agenda. They are pushing their own agenda. So if it doesn't suit them, then they will talk this language, you know? So um, in, in our country, there's a norm. Uh, uh, there's a norm in, in, in our country that uh, we don't have to show something that we dent our image. You know, we are this rainbow nation, we are this example to the world, so this ugly stuff must appear. You know, <coughs> these, these, these workers, these the, the, the <coughs> police, they have no option but to shoot in self defense. But if you question, Okay, let's say it's true. They were attacking the police and then the police shot at them. So what about the second scene? If you look at the second scene, is that how many meters look from the You know, it's like a distance. The, the first scene and second scene is distance. And if, if you read these books that look at mentioned, like uh, the killing in a small copy, it tells you exactly what happened there. Because those people were running away. And there were, there, were, there, were police, there were soldiers there. Army was there, but it's not mentioned in the media. Others people, other people were, 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 were walked over by these, these nyalas, by these hippos. You know, some were shot at the back, some were shot hiding. You know? So you ask yourself, how are they, how are they attacking after 17 people were killed <coughs> in the first scene? Because a couple of minutes, other 17 were killed. Others were, were, were injured. Others were killed at the hospital. You know, and then in the question of 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 um, of the mind, they play a, cru a crucial role. They made sure that they put pressure to Syria, so Syria can put pressure to the deployees of the ANC, like Susan Shabazz, to make sure that they they order four thousand ammunition, last ammunition from from Jobik. They, they, they have four, four, four much other events. You know, this communication between, between Bernard, Bernard Mkwena and Susan Shabangu, Bernard Mkwena, Susan Shabangu, and, 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 and Cyril Ramaphosa, it, it, it will give you an indication of what happened then, why we end up where we were. Because I can hear some people who say, but you guys were talking about 34 mine workers. What about the 10 people who were killed then before? You know, we understand <coughs> that those are people who were killed. And if you look straight, as look as I said earlier, two policemen were killed, two security guards were killed, six mine workers were killed. You know? So, so by then, the management, the, 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 the government should have intervened and said, no, it's enough. Go and talk to the workers as the management, because they want you there. Instead, because you have killed police, you're going to revenge by killing more people. So the role of the management and, 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 and the state was a dumb and head. You know, although today we find the opportunists, a lot of them who go there and attend the commemoration and talk about ANC, talk about Zuma, <coughs> talk about Ramaphosa, forgetting to mention them, the, 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 the might, the management, because they are there for political scores. You know, they, okay. My comrade there said maybe they've turned this like a woman's day, blah blah yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. They are there to, to score points. This how politics because if you can look and analyze or look like like why they have to act quick and kill people and, and end up killing people, it's because they they saw that there's this young man whom they they say is the speed of an ANC Malem. Malema went to Impala and then he supported the workers there and then they got that 9,000 increase. It was, no, it was, 
but we're earning like 5,000, 4,000, then to increase and then they earn 9,000. My lemma there was, he is a hero. So they knew that he's coming this side. So if they can kill this before he, 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 came, he, he arrived there, you know, that's when they make a plan. Because now they didn't look at, 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 at the possible ways to stop this. But the simplest way was to say, uh, management, they want to talk to you. Talk to them. And try to find a solution. Because after a couple of days, to September, there was a 200 increase. And then we had to get as well. So what stopped them there before killing people? You know? So that's the problem. Um, Okay, can I can I stop there? But uh, with, with my two injured comrades, um, <coughs> I will say um, he's powerful. You know, he he makes sure that if you 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 talk, you are you are out of the picture. Not like kill you, <coughs> but out of his way. You know, as I, as I mentioned that 2014, there were there were comrades who were leading who were leading workers' community before they, 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 they joined AMCO. Those guys were bad mouthed by um, by, by to the masses who say those guys, they have been bribed, they've been given millions to form another union. This, this guy, this guy, he, he's been bad mouthed by, by, by the guy. But now, he's talking another language where he's, he would say like, no, he's better. But I mean, this guy cannot be trusted. Thank you. If I can ask answer questions, look maybe. So I'll just go quickly uh, to your question about um, why we're not talking about the role of lawmen uh, in the Americana killings, the Americana massacre. And I think it's a it's a good point. Um, okay. The, I'm not highlighting it as much as I could. And even in the film and in Murder at Small Copy, they do talk about it. And if you listen to Dali Mpofu, uh, the lawyer on behalf of the families, he talks about the toxic collusion uh, between Lon Min, the NUM, uh, and the politicians. I'm highlighting the, the police because they did pull the trigger. And then we also talk about um, you know, uh, the government uh, bringing in the rounds of uh, ammunition, but it's a, it's a very it's a good point. Um, <coughs> there's a question about the personality uh, cult of Joseph Matundra, and I think, you know, the, the way we framed it, the way it's framed in the book is different than it's being presented, you know. The, I think Sapiwe is putting across some of the, the views of some of the key uh, worker leaders and how they've been marginalized uh, by Matundra and also you know the negative impacts that's had upon the, the movement. How we framed it in the book is that he played a contradictory uh, role in relation to the grassroots movement because on the one hand um, he marginalized some of the key organic intellectuals that were emerging like uh, this guy Makani here that Sibiwe was talking about well, on the other, at that time, in 2014, um, he actually united uh, the workers around a common demand <coughs> for 12,500. And he was democratic to the extent that the workers held him accountable and he didn't turn his back and end the strike until the workers told him that he could at the very end of the five month strike. And we detail that. I mean, I think the <coughs> the question that you're asking about um, what has allowed it, the internal dynamics of the of AMCU and of the the mine workers, um, I think Sapiwe partially spoke to it, and because he was saying like the songs that they sing, you know, they they've internalized the logic of the personality cults. That's part of the problem. So people you know, love Matundra. And the question of class consciousness is, is important. Why, why, while we framed it in the book, and while to a certain extent it's true symbolically and in practice, because it is a struggle 
of you know like down press mine workers against the third largest platinum mining company in the world and they do crush the independent working class power mm -hmm. like through uh, police brutality and through the killing of the mine workers <coughs> that's true but on the other hand the mine workers are not inherently class consciousness and class conscious you know and there's a degree of narrow trade unionism because it's about mine workers and the, the mine workers and AMCU don't have organic links with other movements, trade unions, or other parts, other aspects of movements like the community-based movements, other trade unions, the student movement. Okay, Matunja has given some speeches, but there's no like direct link or solidarity around the different forms of struggle. I don't know if that's quite getting into your, the question you're asking. Um, and then Amku did play a role. I mean, the, the fifth chapter is called, there's a whole chapter called The Rise of Amku and the Demise of Worker Committees. And that's partially about how Amku disbanded <coughs> the worker committees, but also how the worker committees disbanded themselves. Uh, because they needed, at that point in time, a degree of institutionalization. <coughs> One of the mine workers in the book was saying, we didn't want to have another Americana again. And this is what happens when you operate outside of the, the labor, the institutionalized labor bargaining system. They're saying, we need now to go inside a union and to, to have that formal representation when we go on strike again because the workers didn't think that now that they ended their strike. In fact, when, when those strikes at Amplatz and Longman ended, it was on the basis that next year, wage negotiations would continue. But then they didn't continue until 2014. So throughout 2013 and then, you know, mid-2012, <coughs> throughout 2012 and into 2013, <coughs> that's when Anku gained, you know, for, formal bargaining, you know, well, that's when they had, like, they were able to bargain formally with their employer through AMCU. They had offices, formal recognition. That's what I'm trying to, to get at. Um, I think one point I'd like to make as well is that we wrote the book, in the, we did the book in the middle of an insurgency. And when there was time to, to celebrate <laughs> the mass movement that had emerged and how effective it had been, in the context of you know the state apparatus completely clamping down on the movement and then still like carrying on, everyone, the mine workers, ourselves, and everybody else, was surprised that the the movement that the the strike of 2014 lasted five months, and you know we had been there throughout a lot of 2012 into 2013, and then the book culminates with the the great strike of 2014. So we end, you know, and the, you know, it's sort of a it's slightly celebratory, <coughs> but we and to a certain extent it can be said that it romanticizes, but we do hint at some of the problems in the book about the the internal dynamics, particularly of Anku. Um, I mean, I think one of the other reasons why we're putting it, <laughs> saying a couple things about, you know, the president of AMCU is because this fifth commemoration has passed and some of the people who were there, you know, some of the main people who were involved there talk about how, you know, the key leaders who were on the mountain were not actually at the commemoration. So talking about it as a show that was put on, you know, and there was a lot more resources put in it put into it, it was a lot more well planned and it was a lot more driven by the central leadership of AMCU to our understanding. And the day after that, AMCU, the day after that commemoration when warnings were given to uh, AMCU leaders who were challenging the dominant perspective inside the union were assassinated. So we were trying to give you know, a little bit of a spin on that, I think. But, um, I'll just say quickly that, you know, how 12500 was classified into a living wage. <coughs> okay, I think there's a lot of different ways you can talk about it, but the main point, you know, that we were trying and maybe other people were trying to put across 
is that it was called a living wage because normally workers would bargain around what management, what they thought management could afford, or around a certain percentage, like 8%, 9%, 11%, 12%. Whereas in this instance, workers were literally bargaining, bargaining around um, what they needed, the amount of money that they needed to live on. So that was therefore called the, you know, the living wage of 12,500. Um, there were specific questions around the intersection of politics at the time that we get into in some detail. Um, you know, we give a list of organizations actually at the beginning and a list of a number of uh, key figures and also a timeline of key events. But the, the you know, the, the workers and socialist party, uh, which stood in the elections in 2014 and got about 8,000 votes was formerly basically the democratic socialist movement which had been operating for a long time. And they had been involved in the platinum belt uh, since 2009. So well before like these events captured the imagination you know, of a nation. And you know, during that period, we do detail, like they, they were trying to form national strike committees, bringing together all the different worker committee leaders in that region and beyond and we detail that, um, but over time, they became like all the other left-wing organizations like the Democratic Left Front and others, marginalized because of the apolitical positioning of AMCU and because of the way it, it, it ostracized left-wing <coughs> ideas, academics or anyone, you know, that, at least that's my understanding of it. So the DSM, and I mean WASP, even though it has these claims of being rooted in Americana, it's not rooted in Americana anymore. Although they, they played an important role. Similarly, AMCU, you know, the South African Federation of... Okay, I could explain some of the political context, which is that the South African Federation of Trade Unions is the new federation, uh, which is an alternative to COSATU, which has emerged largely out of NUMSA's split from the ANC at the end of 2013, which was linked to, because NUMSA said, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa said, that one of the reasons they're splitting from the ANC, in addition to its capitalist policies, which they quoted, is that the ANC killed the people of Marikana. Then they, they came up with the idea you know, of having a united front, which hasn't been particularly effective, but there's been different places where it's been in operation. And another thing that they are at the forefront of is, is forming uh, a federation. So there's like 20-something unions in this federation, uh, but it has so many members, because it's the largest trade union, it, it has like half the members, so it's dominant in the South African Federation of Trade Unions. And then obviously we have the expelled Bavi like coming in as a leader. But then we have AMCU with its largely apolitical, anti-outsider like position. Um, I think SAFTU is trying, the last I understood is that SAFTU is trying to get AMCU to come to the table. And they're not saying that they won't, but they're also, I don't think, like actively involved. Also, the AMCU is in like internal chaos uh, at the moment with you know its shop stewards and leadership. So even though it has you know more than a hundred thousand members, um, you know I think they would find it problematic bringing in those shop stewards to a SAF2 uh, meeting. But that's just my that's my interpretation. There's other stuff I missed. You could ask. Or just so, <coughs> what is what is the the question about uh, the class, <coughs> class unity? Is it? Yeah.